let's look at some of the factors that are associated with this. First off, uh, we have to identify the final desired stimulus. What is the goal that you're trying to transfer the control to? Okay. Uh, make sure that that stimulus uh, represents the real world. Um, and what you and what you want the behavior to the, to occur. If I want a kid to respond to the statement of "What's your name?", um, then I'm not gonna just say, "Hey, who are you?" Right? Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But that I mean that's not a real sort of. Uh, I mean, I could, I could, bad example. Sorry. I mean that, that's really one of those things. Who are you? <laughs> you know, maybe that does work. All right. Um, but you want that final desired stimulus to match exactly what the real world is like. Um, so again, in my woodworking stuff, if I the final desired stimulus is to see a bumpy board, all right, so that's the stimulus, and then know what to do with your plane, right? and then actually go out and plane it and smooth that board out. Okay. When we're dealing with the prompts, all right, um, so we're gonna again, oftentimes we fade out the prompts, right? So the prompt is using an effective prompt at the beginning. Um, and if that does not evoke the, origin, the, the, the response that you want, right, then fading from there on out is not going to work. In other words, this simply says you need to have a good uh, dis discriminative stimulus. It has to be a real SD. It has to be one that already uh, basically cues the appropriate response. Um, all sorts of types of prompts here, physical ones, gestural ones, modeling, verbal, environmental, so on and so forth. Um, all of those things I've kind of given examples of already. Uh, gestures are interesting ones um, where you're just kind of signaling or hinting that uh, a particular response is what you want and you can fade that gesture out. Modeling, showing somebody what to do, um, verbal we've already talked about, environmental we've already talked about. Uh, we can also talk about something in the environment uh, to make the response more likely. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of this one. I'm kind of drawing a blank here, but uh, uh, you know, I, I think of this in terms of self-management, really. And it, it doesn't—it's not a perfect example of fading, but it'll work. Um, on my computer, you may have heard the little thingy go off, right? The bing, right? I got a couple of different sounds that are on there. Um, one of them is for my like schedule, if I've got a meeting coming up or something like that. So I have added that stimulus to the environment, right? That stimulus has pretty good control over my behavior. Ultimately, in fact, the, the pretty good, and you guys are probably laughing because you know that I'm always late to class, right? But that's that's kind of the example that I'm getting at here is that um, I've got a signal that says, hey, it's time to go to class, right? And it makes a particular noise. Ultimately, I should just know when to go to class, right? But uh, because I get wrapped up in here doing stuff like recording lectures or failing to work on your test or, I don't know, just drinking coffee, whatever it is, right? Um, but I'll go to class and then, you know, I'll be a little late. The idea is that that prompt in the environment is going to make my response of being on time more likely. Right? Uh, some of the other stuff you can do with your with, with fading is to take a particular discriminative stimulus and make it more obvious. So that uh, one of the things that I've done with my email actually is uh, you know how on my email client all my emails are bolded if they're unread. Well I changed it from just bold regular black font to bright blue. So now an unread email sticks out like a sore thumb. It's just it's brighter than the blue that's on this slide, and it just sticks out there and says, "Oh, this needs your attention." And believe it or not, every couple of months I change the color. So the next color that I have on my list is hot pink. So hot pink is coming up. So that's the next one that's gonna um, cue me to make the particular response of checking that email. Right? And this is just about making that discriminative stimulus more obvious. <laughs> as as is true with most of this particular field, uh, people want to know answers to questions like, how many steps does it take to fade a stimulus? Uh, well, you know what? There is no rule. Right. As many as it takes. I mean, that's the answer. Uh, you know, how many steps? Well, as many as you need to make it happen. There is no rule. It doesn't say you have to have seven steps or 10 steps or 20 steps. Basically, what you have to do is simply watch the performance. If the particular, if the if the stimulus, if the new stimulus, the one that you're fading to, has control over the behavior, you're successful. If it doesn't, add more steps. <laughs> um, try and, and break it down a little further. Right? Uh, too many errors indicates that uh, if if the child's not making the appropriate responses, I'm going to use an example here of having them choose a color of pens. You got two colors of pens. 
uh, or multiple colors of pens or something like that, and you're having them choose, identify a green pen or something, and they keep choosing the wrong one. Maybe you're asking them, and maybe you didn't make enough steps uh, between the color green and the fact that the, the pen has a color as well. Right? Uh, maybe you didn't teach enough examples or something like that, and that's essentially what we're talking about here. So if the kid's making a lot of errors, uh, chances are you're taking too big a step. Right? Uh, you're making your changes too large. So if you go back to that example of the sevens, right? So maybe if I just went from the group of seven dots to the um, uh, a, a f very faded out seven dots in the pattern of a seven with a seven written over it, maybe that's too big of a step. Maybe they won't be able to say the word seven when you show them that stimulus. Maybe they will, maybe they, but if they don't, um, then you're, you haven't added enough steps. <laughs> and the, the other pitfall here is that too many steps will produce dependence on the prompts. You're going to be, you know, they're, they're going to require some sort of prompt in order to continue. So you want to teach, you're trying to teach them that skill of generalizing. That's really what this is about, is kind of teaching that generalization skill. And if you do too much support, this is like helping somebody too much, then it's going to backfire on you.